Hi, welcome to another episode of the Akiona Law Podcast, wherein we talk about all things that intersect in the areas of family law and divorce. My name is Lonnie Akiona, owner of Akiona Law Family Law and Divorce for Firm, and I'm so excited to have today co-parenting coach Karen Bunnell. Hi, Karen. <laughs> welcome to the show. Lonnie, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with an attorney who really gets that the heart of family law is the word family and how important it is that we remember, even as we restructure our families at the end for our children, there's still family. And that's what our goal is. And I'm so excited to have you here. You have like over 30 years experience working in this area, working with families and the you've written um, the books that you've written, which kind of really help shape how we attorneys are approaching our cases and working with families. You've got the co-parenting handbook that Correct. came out in 2014 and then again in 2017. Correct. Second, okay. second edition in 2017. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Uh, and you've got the parenting plan workbook. And that's a video series, right? Well, it has a video series that marches right along with it. Uh, Felicia Mosby Soleil, attorney in Gig Harbor, is with me on those. So we're talking both from a, a legal perspective and the coaching mental health perspective, but it just walks parents through the thinking behind a child-centered parenting plan. And then you've also got, you recently came out with the Step Family Handbook from dating to getting serious to forming a blended family. Correct. I mean, it's all just part of the continuum, isn't it? Original yeah. families, restructuring that original family. And guess what happens often within two to five years is we restructure again as adults recouple and create next time families. And the co-parenting handbook is available on, on, audio, on Audible? On Audible, as is the Step Family Handbook. Oh, okay. Great, exciting. So tell us, how did you how did you get into this field? Because you actually started off, I believe, as a psychiatric nurse. No, crazy, right? <laughs> um, yeah, crazy being the word. Yeah. So I was trained as a psychotherapist, an outpatient psychotherapist, and I am, you're right, a I was a licensed nurse practitioner in psych mental health. I did that solidly for 30, 35 years, but right along the way. A couple walked into my office one day when I was a psychotherapist, and they said, our very best friends told us that you would help us get divorced. And I said, no, <laughs> I don't. I've never done that. I don't do right. that. I had been divorced myself. So I was at least acquainted with the process and a parenting plan and this and that and this and that. And after about three rounds of they said you'd say that and we're supposed to tell you you'll do it anyway, I finally gave in and I said, hey, listen. I will help the two of you have the courageous conversations that you need to have in order to develop a child-centered parenting plan with one caveat that when you leave this office or when we're done in that process, that you immediately take it to family law attorneys and have it vetted and examined and you get the legal education and so forth, <clears throat> which they agreed to do. I would, okay. you know, cause I, I had never done it before and I was very clear that I was just helping them have the conversations. Well, they came back after meeting with their attorneys and they had both been given very high marks on what they had accomplished. And what oh, we did you together said, was you said you, you said you helped them develop a child-centered parenting plan. Correct, correct. So, and, yeah, and so that got me so very okay. excited that I went to the law school that March. They do the Pacific Northwest um, Dispute Resolution program every okay. year at the University of Washington. I went and I fell in love. I just fell in love with collaborative divorce coaching. I fell in love with consensual dispute resolution. It really answered something for me about families when they need to restructure, something I wanted to be a part of. Yes. So when did you make that transition then? What year was that? That was 2006. Yeah, wow. 2006. And so from then on, um, I've just been, I dwindled down my practice. I saw my last psychotherapy client in 2014. Um, so it was dwindling down psychotherapy, increasing um, all things related to family law, family restructuring, divorce coaching, co-parent coaching, dispute resolution. So let's, let's get into the meat and potatoes. What is a co-parenting coach? 
Great question and an important one. So there are lots of, so let me start out by saying anybody can be a co-parent coach. So someone who went through a divorce and decided they now want to help other people go through divorce can literally put up a website and say, I'm a co-parenting coach or I'm a divorce coach or I help you get away from your narcissistic spouse or right. any of those things. And I think that's important for listeners to know that all coaches are not equal. And what do I mean by that? It's important when you're choosing a coach, whether that's a life coach, a divorce coach, a co-parenting coach, that you look at what their training and background is, right? Are they right. trained to do, are they literally trained to do the work they do? Or are they basing it on their own one-off experience and they now want to share that with you? That's just important to yeah. know. But anyway, that being said. Most co-parenting coaches that work in the collaborative law community or in consensual dispute resolution have at least a master's degree in a mental health field, okay, okay. such as social work or psychiatric nursing or a licensed um, counselor. They have okay. a master's degree plus licensure, okay? Yeah. So those people are committed to taking their family systems knowledge. So they've all learned about family systems and their programs and they understand how families work. They're taking that information as well as good solid basic mental health information about how adults function. Okay. And oftentimes they also have a child development background. So oh. notice three things, family systems, adult mental health, child development, right? So when they have that combination of underpinning for the work that they're going to be doing with you, you can imagine that's a rich body of knowledge, right? To right. draw from as they're coaching either you individually or you and your soon to be former spouse to become the co-parents that you want to become. So that's what a co-parent coach is. Um, okay. And sometimes it's sometimes they're called divorce coaches. They divorce yeah. coaches do the same thing. Okay. Um, it just happens to be that most co-parent coaches, like in my case, I start with people before they enter their divorce process and work with them all the way throughout and after, right? Okay. So then I might be functioning as a divorce coach, becoming a co-parent coach, right? Okay. Sometimes co-parent coaches start after the divorce is final and they're right. simply helping what we call post-decree once the divorce is complete. So basically coming in after the divorce, okay, so let me just, just reiterate here. So yeah. the divorce coach essentially comes in at the beginning of the process and helps people transition to becoming um, parent-centered, maybe creating a, a child-centered parenting plan. Right. And how to after, mediate that plan. Mm -hmm. How to mediate that plan to, to create, to focus on what you know, focus on the child um, right. rather than get, getting past that parent dynamic or conflict. Mm -hmm. And then when that, if that's done, you can come in afterwards, but you're no longer divorce coach because the divorce is finalized. You're now the co-parenting coach, right? Helping parents function together post-separation for the benefit of their child. To keep that kiddo or kiddos central as they begin to stabilize in two home family life. It's not an easy transition. It's very doable, but with support, it's, it's certainly much easier than sort of inventing the wheel, you know, one couple at a time. Otherwise couples are kind of trying to invent a wheel, right? That they don't need to do alone. You know, right. we know what really supports two home family life. We know what's gonna help children thrive. So co-parent coaches want to help parents know that information at the first possible moment that it's useful. Right. And it just kind of ties in hand in hand, I guess, in terms of my next question was going to be, what's the benefit of working with a co-parenting coach um, for people who don't, you know, who still kind of need that question in their mind? And I, I to me, my very simple lawyer answer is, well, instead of you coming to me and spending money to help you resolve this conflict and not really getting something that you're happy with, you use a co-parented coach to not only help you resolve conflict, but learn to better communicate with the other parent, which is really folk and to focus on your child. You know, a good metaphor, you're absolutely right, Lonnie, but think about this. When we find out if we were, if we became parents because we birthed a child, right? Like we made a decision to get pregnant, we're now pregnant. 
most couples, most sets of parents take a birthing class. Yes. Right? Yes. They go and they find out all this information together. They learn how to breathe in ways that are going to facilitate that delivery. They learn about how they'll handle unexpected outcomes, God forbid. They don't keep going back to the obstetrician for all of that, right? They, they just right. don't, right? And right. so the co-parent coach can function like that preparation yeah. for childbirth coach, who is going to be that preparation for divorce or preparation for two-home family life. This doesn't mean the obstetrician the attorney in, in our metaphor isn't important. It's a different resource. Right. Right. All that psychoeducational work, some of the emotional unpacking that needs to happen, it's going to happen over there with your divorce or co parent coach, where your legal guidance, your um, information around the legal process, and of course, all the ideas that come with your many years of experience are going to be helpful. But typically, you're only working with one member of the couple. Almost always, I'm working with both of them because at the end yes. of the day, they're both going to be parents together, even though they're living separately, even though they're not married, they're still parents together for that kiddo. And that's, that's, and that's one thing too I like about your book, Karen, you throw in these really great real life, you know, these great examples to illustrate the point. And just that example right there, like, I'm pretty sure my husband and I took some a class, learn, like learn how to swaddle a baby and even how to change diapers. Yeah, You're like, what the heck is swaddling? <laughs> <laughs> no, and then, it, you know, and then later on when the baby comes working with like a breastfeeding coach, because nobody tells you how to do that. That stuff doesn't come naturally. There's actually a way to do it. I was like, oh my gosh. So much work. So it makes sense right. when you transition it that way, that this is just another way to kind of support not and support basically the child transition to minimize that conflict because you don't want to be back in court every single time when right. the divorce is finalized. It's exactly. so stressful. Exactly. The better and, we understand. Oh, excuse me. I was just going to say no, the, more, the more skilled and the more skilled and prepared we are the easier it is for children to move through the, their own grieving process and get right. back into their developmental stages and just start to rock and roll again. Remember, living across two houses is not what harms children. Children oh. learn how to move back and forth between yes. their home with one parent and their home with the other parent. Just like they, you know, in, in days of old, many older people like myself had the experience of having a home away from home at a grandparent's. And it was never stressful to go stay at the grandparents. You just went and stayed at the grandparents, right? You knew right. where your toys were. You knew where your bed was. You knew where you put your clothes. Kids are very capable of learning how to move between their homes. What's harmful yes. is when parents get them caught in the middle, when they fight, when that is, and when parents can't work together to make those transitions smooth, that's what's hard on kids. So those are the skills I teach how to do it in a way that's best for kids. You know, Karen, that's such an important thing that you just said right there. It's not the going back and forth and living in two households that stresses our kids out. It's a conflict between the parents. And you, you make me just think, you made me think back when my mom and dad were divorced and they got divorced when I was really young, maybe three years old. So that's all I've known. And just, you know, you know, went back and forth. It was fine. And no problems. But what it was when I think about it now, there was never any conflict between my mom and dad. And it was only when I got older and then my mom was old enough to tell me things. And I'm like, oh, wow, you never told me that. And of course, my mom was like, why would I? You're just a kid. I'm not going to involve you and stuff like that. And right. it makes sense. I'm like, well, thank God she didn't because I never had any problems because they didn't put me in their conflict. They didn't and it, put and it had you in the middle. And it had to do with stuff too, you know, what's the biggest conflict that has to do with child support and fighting and things like that. But I never knew anything, never knew any of that. Right. Um, so yeah, but your mama, your mama was so wise. I just have to say, yeah. give a shout out to your mama who still with us on the planet, because here's the thing, parents often forget that children need to be protected from adult problems. Right. We do it intuitively. We do it intuitively in a one home family, in a, you know, in a healthy one home family, we don't expose children to things that they have no control over or they have no part yeah. in, right? 
And your mama was smart enough to know that she wasn't going to use you as an ally by telling you things about your dad that could have harmed your relationship with him. Right. Right. So important and so true. And thank you, mom, for doing that. (laughs) Go mom. (laughs) I know she's amazing. She's very amazing. Honestly. Um, She basically brought me and my sister up as a single parent and just never, we never knew how hard it was. So thank you, mom. But moving forward, I think you brought forth a very important concept in your book, the co-parenting handbook that talks about spouse-centered mind and parent-centered mind. Can you explain Mm -hmm. what that is? You bet. The quick course on that is two adults. Okay. We're just going to talk about this as kind of a normative sort of stereotypic example man and a woman, they meet, their hearts light on fire, they fall in love, right? Okay, and they get married. All right, now that can of course be two mamas and two dads, but let's just go with dad and mom. Okay, Uh, uh, man man and woman. Okay, so they fall in love, they get married, and together they decide to have a child. So when they're up here, they're adults, they're professionals, they're now spouses, husbands and wives, they have a child, okay, little one gets born, they become parents. All right. So the fact is that they have identities now as professionals or people or workers, and they are husbands and wives, man, woman, all that kind of stuff. But they add into it mom and dad. So these are like roles, right? Right. And when we're married and in a one home family, they're all smushed together just like this, right? So husband, wife, man, woman, you know, mother, father. When we separate and divorce, what comes to a close? What we are bringing to an end is the husband wife is the spousal relationship is the intimate partnership so what we have to untangle out of this web of roles and relationships is the husband wife piece we're going to pull that out we're going to pull that out so we're still going to be man or woman we're still going to be our worker or professional selves whatever that is and we're going to be connected in one place and one place only as parents We are a parenting pair until death do us part when we have a child together. I love that. So parenting pair until death do us part when you have a child. That's That's exactly right. So co-parenting, sometimes parents will come in and they'll say to me, okay, I can't co-parent with that person. I don't trust them. I'm not going to co-parent with them. I mean, they just got their foot down and their jaw clenched. And I look at them and I say, do you share a child with that person? Well, yes, I do. And I say, then it's not a question of whether you'll co-parent. The question is, will you co-parent skillfully? That's the question. That, that's kind of mind blowing. It's not a question of whether or not you're going to co-parent because you have a child together. It's a question of whether you're going to co-parent skillfully. Exactly. Or, or not. Your child. <laughs> or your child. Or not. Or so not. Back to our question. Spouse okay. mind is yeah. all the stuff related to being adults who got married, had an intimate partnership that did not endure, that did not sustain. And there's often all kinds of feelings about that, Lonnie, yeah. hurt and betrayal, disappointment, grief, loss of lots of dreams. I mean, you yeah. name it, but that's all up here in the spouse mind. As parents, as parents, when I get parents in my office, I don't care how distressed they are. There comes a point when I say to them, I want to I wanna learn about your kiddos. So I want to hear from both of you about Madeline and Tyler right? And then one of them will start. And honest to Pete, the the iPhones come out because now I'm going to get pictures of Madeline and Tyler. And they're, they're looking at each other like, don't you think Tyler's just got the best smile ever? And Madeline is really smart and she's a little athlete. And suddenly all of the noise is out of the room because as parents, and I tell parents this, you are the luckiest parents in the world because you have Madeline and Tyler. And don't ever forget the responsibility that you have to steward them into adulthood. It's the parenting pair that you'll always be. Wow. You know, that just, that just, last night was my husband's 50th birthday and we went out to dinner and we took our kids and we took our, you know, we, we took our kids to this place and I said, Hey, this is the first dinner that we're having together as a family where we're going to this special occasions restaurant. 
because you guys have always been too young. They're 14 and 16. So now you get to join me and dad on the special occasion. Oh. And, my, and my husband said, you know, you know what my greatest achievement is? He goes, having you boys. And I said, wait, no, no. First it's marrying me, then having you boys. <laughs> right on. And, but when he said that, you know, it just, it's like, yeah, my greatest achievement is having you boys it's the kids and it just almost kind of makes me think and you know and just reading your book is just it's so helpful to me me and my husband have been married I always forget we got married in 2000 so going on 22 years beautiful and it's not easy right there's conflict and there's conflict about the kids because right. we have different expectations different ways we were raised right. and reading this book I can see where I'm in spouse-centered mind and you know versus parent mind where spouse-centered mind is like no, it's this, it's this, it's this. And I, I went, I see it now. It's like, I'm in my head, but if I'm in parent centered mind where I'm thinking, like he said, my greatest achievement is to you kids is you, is you kids. That's like the heart that's coming totally. from the heart. So beautiful. And that's yeah. so true. He just spouted off on his birthday about parent centered stuff. And it was beautiful because the boys were there. What a precious yeah. memory for them. <laughs> that he would say that so beautiful but it's just so funny because it's just it just clicked in my head right now that's a really good example of like how we're you know when we argue and just oh no well you've got to do it this way and um and then when he says a comment like that I think I'm just gonna have to like file that in my catalog of like okay parent-centered mind try and focus you know when you're to be parent-centered what's coming from the heart and it goes to that concept like, you know, one, one of our conflicts is always all the time. Like, um, and I use, you said this in your book and I wrote it down. I'm going to pull it up. It says co-parenting is not a competitive sport. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a competition between two homes. Right. And it's Can not a competition to, yeah, well, here's the thing. This is actually something that the legal system has contributed to because we often talk about in divorce that we're going to do put hands on hips for a minute and we're going to do what's in the best interest of our children. Well, the word best implies beneath that is better and beneath that is good. So like there's this stack ranking, a competitive there's already a competitive mindset of which one of you is good, which one of you is better, and which one of you is best, because your children deserve what is best. Yeah. And there's not a parent that's listening, including myself who's speaking, that didn't want what was best for my kids. What I often right. have to say to parents is that what is best for your kids is the two of you to work together to come to solutions and decisions that are good enough for their yeah. well-being. That's what's best for kids. And so we're not looking for the best parent to have more parenting time. That's irrelevant. What we know is best for kids is that children need two good enough parents, loving, engaged, warm, providing structure for their children across both homes. They need two good enough parents, not a best parent and a not so best parent, that's not right. how we think about it, right? Right. So yeah, it's not a competitive sport. And as soon as I hear parents say, well, I just don't think he's thinking about what's in the best interest of our children. Yes. I say, okay, that phraseology is often used as a weapon to say, I'm better than you. Yes. Whoa, exactly. whoa, I, that's, yeah. that's not always conscious, but it's really the truth. And so we make an agreement real early on that neither parent will throw that at the other. You're not doing what's in the best interest of our children. I say, we're not throwing that at each other. We're gonna step back and say, you know, I would really appreciate if we could look at what the American Academy of Pediatrics says about screen time so that you and I can come to an agreement about what's a reasonable amount of screen time for our 10 year old. Right. Right, rather than hands on hip, I know what's in the best interest of our kids and you're not doing it. <laughs> and I, I laugh because I, I feel like I've been in that position with my husband, hands on hip, you know, you're not acting in the best interest of the kids. They need to eat organic broccoli. They need to eat, I know, I'm, I'm that parent. They need to eat macaroni and cheese with some vegetables inside, not just macaroni and cheese. 
And you, you share this thing in the book where it talked about an example of a parent saying, well, I understand my spouse may be a macaroni and cheese type of spouse, but God darn it, you know, gosh darn it, as long as he's, uh, you know, and, and I think, and I think it used, as long as he's the best macaroni and cheese spouse, then hey, hats off. <laughs> That's exactly. As long as he's the best macaroni and cheese dad in the world, I'm just not going to heel nip the fact that for those days that the children are in residence with him, home with him, being loved by him, having the care, warmth, and structure that they need from him, right. mac and cheese, you go, I'll take care of the organic broccoli. I can do that. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, goodness. Yeah, many fights, many fights about that before I kind of, I guess I kind of grew up a little bit. I'm like, you know what? I just have to let it go, you know, <laughs> let him make macaroni and cheese without vegetables, at least be grateful. That's, that's what he's doing, right? Kids are getting he's fed. Modeling, <laughs> modeling boys into men about dads being able to cook and be handy in the kitchen. I don't care if it's just mac and cheese or pizza or whatever. Exactly. Now that doesn't mean that you and he, if you were living across two homes and the boys were really having mac and cheese and pizza rolls and Mountain Dew, you know, <laughs> the entire time that they're at home with their dad, that you and yeah. me would sit down and say, hey, can we take a look at the, again, look at this and take a look at best practices for growing teenage boys, right? Okay. Yeah. That's a different conversation than wielding, you're not doing what's in the boy's best interest. Right. Instead of an attack, you're, you're, you're coming at it from a collaborative, engaging manner. Exactly. Rather exactly. than you're, you're doing this, this, this. And sometimes it's hard because even when, I mean, when you're an attorney and you're in litigation mode, you are in this, you are in attack mode. Um, but I, but, and there's circumstances where that is warranted, of course. And we're not, you know, when we're dealing with someone who may be dealing with addiction issues um, mental health issues or domestic violence issues, but we're talking about in a situation where parents just not are not getting along because of their own conflict, as you're talking about, you know, there's hurt, betrayal, anger, and then it's that conflict is now carrying over to their kids. That's exactly right. And there's a big difference. We don't want to act out our anger through our children as if it's the last, it's the last opportunity for me to hurt you. I'm going to right. hurt you back. And the last place right. that I can do that is through our children. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, that's where we really want parents to be very conscious. Children do not carry that burden. Burden They should not carry that burden. It's not theirs. And it's harmful when we use them as if they are pawns in a divorce process. I want to just right. step back one step, though, to our parents who have complex circumstances for the yes. listeners who might have a, a person that they are divorcing and separating from who might have addictions or mental health right. issues, or maybe honestly, they really don't have adequate parenting skills. That can Absolutely. happen, right? Sure. A parent who's been working 80 hours a week at you know one of our high-tech companies and maybe kind of breezes through on the weekends, but really has never done much in the way of hearth and home parenting, that can happen. Those are things, again, for our children's sake, we don't use that as a privilege to marginalize that parent. Mm. We use that, we use that in terms of what our children need is an opportunity to participate in health restoration. In other words, we need addictions to be treated. Children do not deserve to be left alone with addicted parents. That's not a good thing. None of us want that. At the same time, I would hope for that other parent, for the parent who is not suffering from addiction, to be really clear, get your addiction under control. Do what you need to do to be a safe parent for our children because our kids need you. Because right. our children need you just like they need me. I'm not gonna want them to be with you when you're addicted, right? When you're acting out your addiction, but I will want them to be with you when you can be healthy. So what would that look like? Yeah. How would we structure those daytime visits? How would we structure supervised time on a weekend to go on a picnic if that's what we need to do? So that's a different approach than using the fact that I have a mental health issue, an addiction issue, um, 
even domestic violence that's, you know, if it's being treated, Mm -hmm. is being treated. Everyone in a family deserves to be safe. I say this to all of my parents. Everyone deserves to feel safe, not punished. They deserve to feel safe. So what do we need to do to get there? You know, this phrase, I just thought of a question right now in terms, have you ever had a situation where you've had two parents come to you for an initial meeting where you're forming about co-parenting, has there ever been a situation where after that initial meeting, you see that the parties are just so far apart that you say, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work for you? Or is yes. it just, you? oh, okay, that does yes. happen then. Yes. So there is a very clear exception. Um, well, there's a couple of really clear exceptions. One is someone who has an addiction process operating and has is in absolute denial and unwillingness Oh, okay. and an unwillingness to understand that children deserve sober parents on parenting time, basically sober parents. So that right. would be one. There is another one, Lonnie, and there's a lot written about this. I, I think it's being recklessly handled, but there's such a thing as a character disorder, what we call an oh. access to diagnosis, right? So okay. the words that we'll hear from a psychiatrist or someone who is qualified to make this diagnosis would be someone who's narcissistic personality disorder right. or borderline personality disorder. Yes. Sometimes folks with that particular brokenness are really unwilling and to right. some extent may be incapable of making the changes they need to make to be uh, participative in a okay. co-parenting situation. But you know, in that type of in that type of situation, in that type of disorder, wouldn't wouldn't the the one parent who is dealing with the parent who's suffering from that disorder, wouldn't that one parent benefit with working with a co-parenting coach to learn the skills and tools necessary how to handle that parent? One hundred percent. Okay. Absolutely, one hundred percent. And we got We have to keep in mind that as much as there is such a benefit when we can work together, two yeah. parents work together in co-parenting, that at the end of the day, whether I'm a skillful co-parent or not is in my file. I decide at the end of the day, if I've been skillful in co-parenting practices, it's not because of what you've done, Lonnie. So I'm never gonna say, well, you're a terrible co-parent, so I'm gonna be a terrible co-parent <laughs> back. I mean, this is an eighth yeah. grade, you know, this isn't a spat in the girl's bathroom. This is, yeah. I am going to do what is best by my children as a co-parent and a parent, regardless of what you do. Right. And that's at the end of the day, what's best for kids because one strong parent, you learn this, one skillful parent, yes. even if things are not ideal on both sides, Right. Gives you as a child what you need. Yes. So important. And, and so I love important. your analogy there. Just because one person is being a shitty go, shitty co, excuse me, a crappy co parent <laughs> doesn't mean I, did, I get to be one too. It's almost as if, okay, well, because you're an alcoholic husband, that right. means I get to be an alcoholic too. No. Right. Bring out like, the Chardonnay. Let's both know, just get I, trashed. You know, I, t I tell when I'm in that situation, I tell them, hey, you should check out Al-Anon, which is basically a support group to help, you know, with people who do have loved ones, spouses, friends, family members that are alcoholics and how you can deal with that. Learn the tools and skills you need to cope with an alcoholic one. So the same thing where if you're dealing with someone who has a borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder, why not work with a co-parenting coach? So at least you can be the best parent you can possibly be for your kid's success. I love that idea. Right. Exactly. Wow. Now, just one comment about the okay. business of using in the vernacular, someone's a narcissist. I learned a beautiful, beautiful thing from Bill Eddy, and you might be familiar with Bill Lonnie. He is an attorney who became a family therapist, major contributor to our field. And Bill taught something to me years and years and years ago, I will never forget. Take a normally high-strung person. Mm -hmm. That would be me. I'm a normally high-strung person. I'm kind of like, let's make things happen, right? Yeah. And, and you put that person under enough stress. Right. And they begin to look like a high conflict personality person. Mm -hmm. 
You right. take that person, now you put them under that much stress and you put them under even more stress and they are very much going to look like a narcissist. They're Such going to, worse. they're going <laughs> to, exactly my point. So yeah. they're going to cope from a place of such compensation that they can look like something that's actually a very serious diagnosis. It's different right. when you look like you have behaviors like someone with narcissistic personality disorder and someone who has it. And I want to be very clear about that because I believe that term, he's a narcissist, she's a narcissist, she's a borderline, is completely overused. It's yeah, about it's about maybe seven to ten percent of our divorcing families wow. who are suffering with something that complicated. Yeah. The other, the rest of us, we might wish we could say, the reason I can't get along with my soon-to-be ex-spouse is because they're a narcissist. Hey, again, hands on hips. Hands but on let's, hip. let's, let's be careful. Let's be fair. And let's remember our kids actually need two good enough healthy parents. We don't need to be labeling each other or mislabeling each other. You know, that's such an important point too, because it just, I, I, I'm thinking back some of the cases I've gone through divorces where that was thrown around and you get a psychological evaluation and that's not what the evaluation comes about with. Demonstrates. The, the evaluation recognizes that the parent is operating in a lot of stress. And so these behaviors are just heightened. And if you're a control freak, like I'm a control freak, I'm very like, I'm very intense right? Let's get things done. Let's get things done. Let's do it my way. I could easily see in a stress situation, such as a divorce, I could come across as a narcissist. <laughs> I mean, exactly. And I know that I could too, because those are that I just up my need to be in control as I get further and further under stress as well, Lonnie. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Many of us do. Many of us do. And so this is why it's important just to have a chat about it. Well, Karen, if I get divorced, I'm coming to you for co-parenting coaching so I don't sabotage my kids. <laughs> and you're like, you're gonna bring you're gonna bring that lovely co-parent of yours oh. along with you, no matter how mad you are, because we're gonna figure that out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I actually feel like coming to you now and be like, hey, me and my husband were kind of high conflict. Help us out. No. Woo. Okay. But I going going on to the two good enough parents. There was something in your book too that I wanted to touch upon. It was about gatekeeping and the idea of two good enough parents so we can if you can go into define what does gatekeeping mean because it's something we throw around a lot in the legal field mm -hmm. but I don't know if people really know what that term means or understand right gatekeeping is really driven from a deep fear of oftentimes of being separated from your child but on top of the fear of being separated from your child a kind of separation anxiety it's also related to a fear that somehow you're gonna fail your child in terms of being able to provide what you believe is yeah. best what you believe is best and so gatekeeping means that i'm going to control the information I'm going to control how the child is cared for. I'm going to right. micromanage you. I'm going to criticize you. Micromanage. Right. I'm going to criticize what you're doing if it falls short of what I believe should be happening. So notice all the referencing. It's going to be driven from, it's going to come up from inside of me and yeah. it's going to cause me to, to do these kinds of behaviors. But at the end of the day, are, I'm just really afraid of the loss that I'm facing, the loss of control over my child, the loss of time with my child, the loss of influence with my child. I really don't want you to go get anybody else in your life. Don't bring somebody in because my gatekeeping, my gatekeeping behaviors are going to escalate if you go mm -hmm. off and get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Yeah. Because now I'm going to even want to try and control more. So without the insight of where it's coming from, driven by deep separation, fear, and anxiety around being away from your kiddo, and the grief, yeah. and the grief associated with the fact that you're not going to be able to execute in the way that you always dreamed. This is my baby. I'm going to raise it my way, and I'm going to do it until they're 47. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> right. If we're not addressing those underlying Ugh. concerns, the gatekeeping's not going anywhere. It comes from a very deep place. Right. 
And right. it's, it's, you know what, it's almost funny. I just clicked in my head right now. It makes me think about when my, you know, when my kids were young and they're one years old and that you talk about the, um, the child anxiety, right? Separation anxiety. Separation. Yeah. When the, you, you leave your baby, you drop your baby off at daycare, the babysitters and your baby's crying. You're like, no, no. And then you happen to check back a minute later and your child's playing and is happy, right? It's that separation anxiety for kids. It almost feels like gatekeeping is separation anxiety for parents. 100%. That is exactly <laughs> what I was trying to communicate. And you just said it beautifully. Um, very succinct. Yes. It's separation anxiety for the parent. Yeah. And I, and I get that. I mean, as a parent, I mean, I had, I, you know, I, I must admit, I could see myself going through separation anxiety, leaving my kids alone, leaving and leaving them with my mom, who I love and trust, who obviously raised me right. And feeling separate, separation anxiety because like, oh no, they're with my mom for a night. Ah. But, but knowing that my mom is good enough, right? <laughs> but so let's just transition over to, and it, sometimes I think it, what can happen, it's like, if I'm a stay at home mom, you know, I have the kids routine. This is what I do. This is when they feed them. I'm taking to their activities. You, you've been working 40, 50 hours a week. There's no possible way that you could parent these kids on their own. Like, how do you move? that parent me past that to give up that trust I mean give you know trust the other person that they can do it maybe not as good as me but good right. enough <laughs> right good enough that's the key first of all it's good enough sometimes I just have to sort of smile to myself because oftentimes that other parent maybe they're running their own company or maybe right. they have been you know managing the entire maintenance department at the high school or what are I mean they have all different maybe they're a police officer it doesn't matter right what matters is they have incredible skills right yeah. I mean if we really sat down and looked at a resume we'd go oh my gosh this person has incredible skills and talents. They might not have been applied to hearth and home parenting, but they have capacity. What's my, what I'm, where am I really going here? They have capacity. So I spend time in that first three, four, five, sometimes six months of co-parent coaching, really downloading from the parent, the hearth and home parent to the non-hearth and home parent, all those skills, right. all those skills and talents. It's a little bit like a download. I will yeah. have a parent say to me, well, he's never even packed Madeline's lunch. He doesn't even know what she likes. And yeah. so he packs her this stupid lunch and it comes home because she comes home to me on Wednesdays and she hasn't touched a thing. I mean, what kind of parent is that? And I, and I look at the parent who's exclaiming this, you know, absolute outrage. And I'm saying, so have you suggested that you'd be willing to write a list of the things that Madeline really prefers in her lunch? I know Madeline's only six. So we're not necessarily relying on Madeline, right? Yeah. But she's not quite ready. She's not 12 yet. And she looks at me like, why would I do that? Why would I help him? Right? Why would I help oh, him? If he's he, should figure this, he, better, he better figure it out. And I look and I say, hold the phone. Who is this about? Is this about Madeline? Do you want her to have a healthy lunch sent to school on Wednesday yes. morning that she yes. will eat and enjoy? And if yes. he just simply doesn't know what that is, what do you think about, what do you think about saying, hey, you know, she really likes Gogurt right now. And she's really got a thing for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Leave out the ham. It, it was a great idea, but she's not a big meat eater at the moment. Mm. Just cue him. He has capacity. He may not have all the information, mm -hmm, but right. he's certainly capable because we've got to remember, this isn't about exposing another parent's weakness. Yeah. This is about helping each other be the best parent you can be for our child. Helping each other be the best parent that you can be for our child. You know, it just, when you were, you know, I was putting myself, like I'm that parent you're working with and I'm, you know, he should be able to figure out his own. And this is what came in my, my head because I'm worried if I help him, then Madeline is going to like him better than me. <gasps> That's what I'm worried about. There you go. <laughs> that Madeline won't love me any less. And he's, Madeline's going to love him more than Madeline loves me. And I don't want that to happen because oh. the home is breaking up. The family's breaking up. And all I've got is my child. Woo. Beautiful. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. <sighs> That's exactly right. <laughs> That's, that's, that's exactly. Right there. And so there we're sitting, we're sitting together in co-parent coaching and that wells up and you offer that vulnerability. You just come out with it. And then I look at you and I say, Madeline is wired in every cell of her being for you, her one and only mama. And oh, that's right. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah, because you're right. Yes. That's what, right. Ooh. Yeah. So the gatekeeping again comes out of separation, anxiety, and fear yeah. and loss. It doesn't come out of real, real reasons because most of the time, both parents have basic capacity. They may need information, but they have basic capacity to learn what they need to learn to be good enough parents. And that's what I love about your book, because it really kind of shifts that thinking. And with the example, how can I move past this? How can I move past this fear that I'm having? And why? Because ultimately, I want us to be the best parent that we can both be for Madeline. And now now as I'm pulling myself together and wiping the tears from our eyes, I wanted to, (laughs) I wanted to switch gears because you gave a really good example in the book, going back to spouse-centered mind versus parent-centered mind. And I can't remember the name. So we'll just, you know, again, just going back to maybe um, the, a husband and wife, an example where the wife had bought herself a sports car, right? They were divorced, bought herself a sports car, wanted to treat herself. And husband was so mad because here he's focused on the, the, the child's extra, extracurricular activities. And so how can the wife buy herself a sports car, but yet she doesn't want to contribute or help out with the extracurricular activities? And you gave this really good example that, of course, I don't know how to say it about how to help them move from spouse-centered mind to parent-centered mind. Right, right. And at the end of the day, that's just such a great example. And aren't we used to it being in the other direction, right? Mom is the one who's not even buying her special face creams anymore to support those extra correct activities. And dad's off buying the gold chains of the sports car. I make a point of trying to change up those examples because we all do it. We all do it in our own small ways. We make decisions about how we spend our money and how we support our kids, right? Those are decisions that each adult will make on their own. And when we, as co-parents, as co-parents begin to judge each other's decisions, when we begin to judge Judge. each other's decisions, right? We bring judgment into it, right? Mm -hmm. Then we introduce a lot of negativity and conflict into our co-parenting relationship. So if I buy a sports car and that's how I want to spend my discretionary funds, we need to sit down and talk about, does it make sense for Tyler to continue or Madeline to continue and select soccer, which is far more expensive than if she plays um, soccer at school? Now she's at an age where she can go out for the girls' soccer team at the high school or in the middle school or whatever. But those are conversations we need to have as parents about our children, as opposed to going back up into that former spouse mind and begin judging each other and criticizing and power struggling over how we think the other person should be living their life. It's no longer in our file. It's Mm. not, it's not ours to judge. Right. 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 So so, sometimes we just have to be graceful. I I just sat with two parents who, um, a parenting pair, who were in a very big power struggle over equestrian riding lessons. Oh. Right? And and one parent is willing to go into debt to afford a lease on a horse. And the other parent is saying, absolutely not. Yeah. And so there's a lot of judgment about if you wanted what was our best interest of our child and I'm willing to, I'm willing to do all these things to make this happen and you are not. So notice that's, those aren't parenting qualities. Those are competitive, judgmental, right? right. You with me? Competitive, so, judgmental, right? Because competitive and judgmental, I'm the better parent. I'm the one who cares more. It's like, okay, first of all, Let's just start with nonsense. All of that is nonsense. You care differently. You value different things, right? Definitely value different things. They care about different things. They want to participate in their child's life in a different way. 
all of that's fair game. Now, what would be important is then if not that, then what? So if not equestrian riding lessons, which okay. for all the parents who are listening, you know, that's an exorbitantly expensive sport. I can and only some, imagine. <laughs> and some people, some people can afford it, but you know, that's neither here nor there. And it's wonderful when kids get to do that. So if she's just going to do regular riding lessons, and then we're going to do some piano lessons, and we're going to do some athletic, maybe we're going to do girls rock, little rock climbing every day, uh, every week for a day. That's what we need to figure out. That's what we need to be talking about when we have a nine-year-old. We don't mm -hmm. need to be in a bunch of thousands of dollars spent on dispute resolution, arbitration, on whether we should have a nine-year-old with a horse lease. You know what, and that brings a really good important point because, you know, maybe, maybe as a parent, I grew up and I played the guitar. So I don't want to spend all my money on these equestrian writing lessons. I want to spend money so my child can learn how to play the guitar, right? Exactly. So why can't we work together? And, and we may have yeah. to, which means that we may sub-optimize everything we might have dreamed was going to happen in order to let what each of us values to be part of our child's life. Okay, so we're gonna bring in the music lessons. We'll keep some writing lessons in there. Maybe we're gonna do girls rock as well. That's not the way I wanted it to be. That's not what I dreamed about. That's not what I think is best. Okay, great. Work through your feelings. Now let's step back. Let's, let's step back. We have a nine-year-old who's doing writing lessons, taking guitar lessons and doing girls rock every week. How does that look? How does that look as a childhood for a nine-year-old? Pretty darn luscious, pretty <laughs> darn lucky, right? So I'm, yeah, I, I have to give up on my dream of my daughter being in the Olympics in the Christian writing because I'm a co-parent. I'm a co-parent for life. <laughs> Who oh, no, knew that's what I was going to have to give up when we got divorced? Mm -hmm. So it's just right. a reminder that there is loss involved and we need to be graceful about that. You know, in this area, it comes up often, as you well know, whether it's select sports or being able to be on a competitive cheerleading squad, which is, you know, $1,000 a month. It's like parents... Uh, you know, I was a competitive cheerleader even back in the day, right? Are you? Like, I was, I was, wow. cheerleaders. I was all that in a bag of chips. Dang. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that my, that first of all, that wasn't my daughter's dream. And, <laughs> that, you know, so let's start with that. Sometimes we've got to separate our dreams out from our children's dreams. I'm speaking yes. to some of our dads about that too. I'm glad yeah. that you were a football star, but you were, you know, Tyler would rather play the violin. So let's get on, let's get on board with who Tyler is not what your ego says. These are often conversations that we're having to have. What, what does your child need? Who is your child? How are we going to do this across two homes? What are your values? Yeah. How are we going to implement those in the best way possible for both of you? There's not going to be a winner and a loser. There's going to be a best way forward for all of you. And I love that because that's essentially what you're talking about in the co-parenting session. We're trying to figure this out. And Karen, I could just keep on talking to you forever. I want to <laughs> be respectful of your time, Bill. Thank you so much for appearing on, on the Akiona Law podcast today, wherein we talk about all things related to or intersect with family law, intersect with family law and divorce. Once again, I've got Karen Bunnell, co-parenting coach. Um, Karen, how can people get a hold of you if they want to get in touch with you? Yeah, I th you know, just they can just Google me, Karen Bonnell. They can Google Coach Mediate Consult. It's all one word, Coach Mediate Consult. Um, yeah, it, it's it's easy. Coach Karen and Kirkland. Honestly, remember Kirkland Costco and Coach Karen, and you got me because that's what's going to come up if you Google that. <laughs> And your books are all available on Amazon. On Amazon. I yes. downloaded your book on Kindle, and, and which I love because I can highlight in yellow and I bookmark the parts, you know, that are practically every other page is bookmarked. Perfect. <laughs> um, Perfect. But also on downloading, on like, can they get you on um, the books for downloading on Audible, you said, right? 
Yeah, both the first edition of the co-parents handbook is on Audible, and then the um, the new the new um, step family handbook from dating to getting serious to forming a blended family is now on Audible since January. So very excited about that. I think the key thing I'd like to say about the step family handbook. Okay. If I might just make a little ad. Yes. That book was really written with the intention for any parent or anyone dating a, or anyone who wants to date a parent. It really starts in the dating phase. And although the title is the step family handbook, you might say, well, I'm not talking about a step family. I just met this yeah. person and I'm just yeah. dating. I don't want them to think I'm running to the finish line. And I just want to say to listeners, please know that that was written with the intention that the minute you're thinking about dating as a parent, or if you're thinking about dating a parent, that's the place to pick, that's when to pick up the book. Mm, and if, okay. if God's willing and the creek doesn't rise and your hearts are meant to spend the rest of your lives together, then the part about blended family, great. That's there for you too. Okay. But it's really about all that other stuff too. So, so to, uh, I hope you folks are listening to that. If you have separated or, or to, let's just say you're divorced and you're thinking about dating again, please, please pick up that step family handbook because it's going to talk about how you go about introducing the, the this new partner, this new love interest to your children and also being respectful of your the co -parent. spouse. Yeah, the co-parent. Thank you, the co-parent. And Karen, we have to get you back on the show so we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love to. Um, oh gosh. So Karen, any, any final thoughts uh, before you leave us? <sighs> I'm first of all, thank you so much for having me. And that, you know, I think the most important final thought is just remembering that kids do really thrive in a two home family with two good enough parents. And what's going to be important is that it matters more to you to provide a safe and secure two home family for your children than it matters to fight about every single little piece of conflict that you have an opportunity to fight over. So rather than fighting over parental rights, I have a right to, I would yeah. encourage you to fight together for what's right for your kids, which is stable, secure, two home family, both parents engaged. Oh, by the way, I just want to mention, co-parenting does not require you to be friends. Just know that. <laughs> Co-parenting requires you to be civil and respectful and to follow the skills. That's where I'd end. Love it. And you can get Karen again. Uh, go to coachmediateconsult.com, coachmediateconsult.com. And Karen also has a YouTube channel. That's right. So there's lots of great videos and yeah, all kinds of stuff that's there to help. Thank you so much, Karen. And to my listeners out there, thank you for joining for another episode of the Akiona Law podcast. Um, until, until we meet again next time, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Take care. The information in this podcast is general advice only and should not in any respect be relied on as specific legal advice.